Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Strength for Today. I'm your host here, Eric Dykstra, and today I just want to really jump in and dive deeper into this whole topic we've been in for a little while here on identity. Before I do that, though, I just want to tell you that I'm really glad and appreciative that you are listening today and honor the identity that God's given you because it's very unique and specific to who you are and you can only do the things that you can do. I can't do them. Your neighbors can't do them. Your coworkers, your children, uh, your parents, wh wh wherever stage of life that you find yourself in, know this friend, that you have a specific identity. And one of the main identities that we have as a follower of Christ is of a much loved child. So that's really going to be the foundation of the message we're going to get into today. And we're going to take a look into Daniel chapter one. Just to recap last episode, we talked from Acts chapter 17 of a guy named Jason who was actually housing Christians during a time where they were being persecuted when the early church was actually just getting started and they were meeting in homes and the city officials and government officials were coming after them because they were proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you recall what they said, and this was fascinating, was that these are the ones that turned the world upside down. And then later on in that chapter, we looked at Paul in Athens, and one of the statements he made was they were serving a God and had an idol that was labeled to an unknown God. And he called them out and proclaimed that this God that they claimed to know, but really didn't know was the one true God. And he said, in him, we live and have our being. And so that is the foundation of what we get to look at today in the life and the expression of Daniel and his three friends. Many of us, if we're familiar with scripture, might know this story. But I just want to give you some background into it, because as we've talked about identity, we've talked about two sources that we can draw our identity from. It's either the flesh or the spirit. And another way I want to put it today is this, is that we have a persona and we also have a personality. And this was a term that I heard several years ago when I was going through a training that really is something that I never thought about before. But what is persona? Persona is the way that we are known in heaven by God, the, own, the, the way that only he can know us because he's the one that created us, gave us our DNA, and really formed our identity even before we were born. So what better way in life to discover our identity than to go to the one who made us, who knows us the best, and who loves us the absolute most out of anybody or anyone in our entire life. So that's where we want to draw our source of identity from. So as you listen to this episode, just begin to think about how does heaven know me? Or have you ever asked that question to, to the Lord? Is how am I seen in your eyes? Because I guarantee you, there's going to be a sense of love, affirmation, comfort, exhortation, edification, encouragement that comes from the way that God shares his heart with you about who he made you. And I often say this to people I interact with is that when he begins to speak into your identity, his whole motivation and inspiration is to empower your identity. Because I believe this, when the Lord begins to empower, enable, and help us to discover and live into our identity, I believe it's the, one of the aspects that brings him the most joy. Because in the Gospel of John, we're reminded that um, Jesus said this, is that he wants us to know the very same love that he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' greatest desire on earth was for us, for the people he came to serve, to die for, and to defeat death and to be ascended back to the Father was so that we would know the love and be the much loved child that he knew 
and created us to be. So that brand, it says, to make my joy complete, that they would feel this love, the expression of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit embracing you today. Just let that sink in, if nothing else, today. Because there's a way that heaven knows you that will define you in a completely different way than how you're known on earth. Because think about this. How are we known on earth? It's through our personality and how we express it. And some of the roles that I live into right now is that I'm a father. I've got three wonderful young children. I'm also a husband to an incredibly uh, beautiful and wonderful wife that I've been married to for 14 years now. And I'm also a brother. I'm a brother to two older men who have been a significant part of my upbringing. I'm a child of uh, parents who loved me unconditionally and were a great example to me. I am a coworker. I, I am an employee. I've been an employee of many organizations. I love to do recreational activities. So I'm an athlete. I'm a competitor. I'm one who loves to be active. So these are many of the personalities that we can take on in the world. And for those of you who may know you to some level, uh, that those might be the characteristics that describe you. But here again, our persona comes from our spirit. The things that God has put in us, our personality is our expression, really, of our true identity. So maybe you like to teach. Maybe you're an extremely gifted musician. Maybe you're incredible with finances. Maybe you're an incredible husband or mother or father or wife. Maybe, you know, you take a lot of pride in, in, in being the child of, you know, the, the, the parents or the other siblings that you have. So these, again, are two ways to describe uh, our spirit or our flesh. And we're going to see this in the life of Daniel as we dive into chapter one. Because in Daniel chapter one, we see a king, Nebuchadnezzar, who really was a pretty brutal king. And he basically came to a point in his life where he said, I want you to go seek out some Israelites and I want you to bring them back into Babylonia, um, into Babylon. They were called the Babylonians and they had their own culture, which really was a secular culture and didn't know God or have any really desire to know the one true living God. They had heard about it, uh, this God. But so they sought him out, and this is what it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. This is from the English Standard Version. It says, then the king commanded Aphanes, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So those were the criteria of a worldly kingdom and system. Does that sound familiar to what we're seeing today? So Israel, these three, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were all brought from Judah out of Israel, they were Israelites, followers of the living God, and they were brought into a Babylonian culture who wanted nothing to do with God and had their own gods that they served and worshipped in their own culture, the Chaldeans had. And so they brought them in to train them up so that they could become servants and useful to promote and further the Babylonian culture and system. And here's the fascinating thing. Daniel resolves in his heart that he's not going to compromise his true identity along with his three friends. And so as they're brought before the king, could you imagine being brought before the king? And that was the criteria based on your knowledge, understanding, and learning. You're, you're competent to stand before the king uh, in your appearance without blemish. I mean, these are things that we humanly can't stand up to when we feel the pressure that comes against our identity. Well, I'm not good looking, or I don't have a lot of knowledge, or 
I can't speak in public like this person can, or I can't write. I'm not as skilled. I don't understand math uh, the way this person does. I'm not good with my hands. I'm not mechanical. I'm, I'm not an engineer. There's all these things that we begin to state about ourselves that really aren't true. And Daniel stays focused on who God has made him to be. Because they go back to Daniel's life, it said that he spent three times daily, four times, several times a day actually praying. And I believe he had a lifestyle of worshiping God. And so when pressure came onto Daniel's life to bow his knee to a false God that he knew would be dishonoring to the one true God that he knew and that he worshiped, he knew the rubber was about to meet the road. And he was in a place where was he going to compromise his true identity and be for, remade or reformed into the Babylonian culture as a Babylonian now? Because that's what they were really subtly trying to do to Daniel and his three friends. Here's a key principle that I wrote down of what Daniel and his three friends did. Is they cried out in private. They were very disciplined and committed. And they were delighted to meet with the Lord daily. And so their heart, their cries were made known to God in private so that when they came to a place in public where their life would literally be threatened and possibly even taken, they had a resolve in them. And they took risks in public. So our private life, our lifestyle of worship will give us a sense of strength on the inside that when push comes to shove externally and in the world and things would normally overwhelm people, we have the strength of God inside of us that pushes back and becomes a fortress, a strong tower inside of us that doesn't allow the worldly system to change us or take us out of our true identity. Is that not good news? And then notice this in Daniel chapter one, verses six through seven. This is the New American Standard Bible version. It says, now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. This is probably a story that sounds pretty familiar, but dig a little deeper underneath the surface of what's really going on. And this was fascinating to me because God is so intentional with everything that he writes and has given us in his word. One of the keys that I've found is in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, begin to look into the names of people and places because they often had a significant meaning and it adds a whole lot of context to helping us understand what's really happening here. So let's take a look at Daniel and what the actual Hebrew name of Daniel meant. So Daniel means God is my judge. And God is capital G, the one true God that they served and worshiped. So God is my judge. Hananiah means God is gracious. These were their original Hebrew names, remember. Michael, Michael or Mishael, I'm not sure how you say it. His name meant who is what God is. So he is the image of God. Azariah means God has helped us or God has helped me. So these Hebrew names are their true identity. And now Belteshar, or I mean, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he's giving them a new name of name of the flesh of the Babylonian culture. And he's trying to take and uproot their spiritual identity and put on them a name given by the world system and culture. Notice this. What names does he give them? He gave the name Belteshar to Daniel, which means keeper of hidden treasure of Bel. Bel was a god that was worshipped in the Babylonian cultures. So now Daniel goes from being God is my judge to keeper of hidden treasures of Bel. Hananiah, which meant God is gracious, was given the name uh, Shadrach, 
which is command of the moon god. So he goes from God is gracious to command of the moon god. So he becomes the one in charge of a god to his former name of God is gracious. Mishael, he gives the name Meshach. Mishael means who is what God is. The Babylonian cultural name that he's given is Meshach, which is who is what a coup is. A coup was another God that the Babylonians worship. So he's taking them out of worshiping the one true God into the image of the one true God into being an image of a false God, a coup. Azariah means God has helped me. He's given the name Abednego, which is servant of Nabu. So Azariah in the Hebrew, God is helping him to he becomes a servant of Nabu. He is serving the God. That's a key difference between what Christianity and all the other religions of the world have to offer is that God is helping us and out of his mercy, his grace and his kindness, he's come into our world and he begins to speak to our identity because more than anything, he wants us to know who he's made us and created us to be in what he's called us to. So God is helping us. Who is what God is? God is my judge. God is my gracious or God is gracious. These are the names of who God made not only them to be, but us to be. And how many times does the world come at us as believers and try to strip us of our identity? And we begin to have experiences in life, whether they're broken relationships, whether it's being wounded or hurt or betrayed or misunderstood relationally, because I'll say it again, one of the deepest senses of pain that we can feel is being alone. And when being alone, we often misassess things and we're not able to attune with God and with other people. And then we're not able to act like ourselves. It's just something that I'll get into in another episode, but that's really the four functions of a, the right hemisphere of our brain, which is relational is that we attach with other people, we're assessing whether it's good, bad, or scary, and then we're able to attune or to take action, to act out of our true identity. And when these things get out of place, we're not able to attach or assess things properly or attune with other people, we can't act like ourselves. And so what does that mean for Daniel and his three friends in the story is that they stayed attached securely in a loving relationship to God, and they were assessing the situation. They remained true to their identity, and what would have been scary for most people wasn't that scary for Daniel and his three friends. Why? Because they were confident, and they trusted the Lord's plan for their life. They stayed true to it, so they were able to attune and to hear from God, and so Daniel counters this, and he says, I don't want your choice food. I don't want your choice drink. Let us stay in the test. Give us vegetables and water. And after 10 days, come back and see the, the, what we're able to do compared to what all these other people in your own culture are able to do. They had a boldness, a confidence, a trust, and a faith in their God. And they were attuning. They were hearing God. And so they were able to act like themselves in this situation. And notice in Daniel 1, verses 8 through 9, it says, but Daniel made up in his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now here's the key in verse 9. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. So because Daniel and his friends were able to stay securely attached in loving relationship with God, they assessed the situation as something good because God was going to work through them in order to change the Babylonian culture when the agenda of the Babylonian king was to bring them in and conform them under the Babylonian culture. See, they assessed it as God was going to work 
for their good and reach people that didn't know the one true living God. And so they attuned with Nebuchadnezzar because we find out in chapter two that they were brought before the king to interpret a dream and none of the other magicians or people, sorcerers that were in that day and age could interpret the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar was threatening them with their life, saying that if you don't tell me my dream and interpret it, then your life is no longer going to exist. And so Daniel becomes aware of this. And he goes to his three friends and he says, this is what's happening. Let's seek the Lord for his wisdom and the gift of interpretation. And God gives them favor and they're able to interpret the king of Nebuchadnezzar. Here's something key that I want you to hear today as well. When it comes to your persona, how you're known in heaven, in your spiritual identity, many of us back away from being in a place like a secular job or a place that per se isn't ministry or given that terminology of working in the church or for a Christian organization. When Daniel and his three friends went into a secular culture and they were reliant on the wisdom of God, the word of God, the knowledge of God, and everything else they had access to only through God to change the culture. What I believe God's doing in the world is he's raising up modern day Daniels and Mishaels and Azariahs and Hananiahs, ones who won't bow our knee, but in a loving, gracious, joyful way, we come alongside the leaders in the world today who don't know the God that we serve and the God that we love. And we now are filled with that love, the love of the Father to love those around us, the Nebuchadnezzar, the Nebuchadnezzars, the, the Babylonian officials. And I want you to be strengthened in your identity today and to know that you have a powerful spiritual identity. And here's three other takeaways, and I'm going to end this episode, and I want you to hear this, is that God provides others around our life that will bring accountability, relationship, and growth. Daniel didn't have to do this alone. He had three friends that brought growth, relationship, and accountability in an extremely difficult and life-threatening situation. Second thing I wrote down was our identity will either shape our circumstances or our circumstances will shape our identity. Because when we live from our spiritual persona, our identity, it says, remember in Romans 8, that the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. So either our circumstances will bow to our identity when we stand in it and live from it, or if our identity is weak from the flesh, it says in Romans 8 that it brings death. So when we're not standing in our spiritual identity, what tends to happen is a sense of death. And our circumstances will begin to tell us and shape us as opposed to the one true God internally shaping us. And here's the last thing is that your influence is multiplied when you operate out of your identity consistently. If you want your influence and leadership, whether it's in your home, at the workplace, on the sports fields and arenas, where at coaching, whatever it might be as a musician, you want your influence to increase and be multiplied. Operate out of your identity, your true God-given identity. Next episode, I want to share with you some of the ways that have been very meaningful and helpful for me. And I'm going to share with you some of my personal identity statements. These were things that I came across several years ago um, when I was part of a, of a ministry and an organization that really opened my eyes to how God forms our identity and where we can look and how we discover and explore parts of our identity. And so I hope you'll join me on Friday. It's going to be very interactive. It's going to be very engaging and hope to give you some examples of what it's like and what it feels like to operate out of your true spiritual identity. We'll see you next time. Hope this has blessed you. May God strengthen you today in your mind, in your heart, physically in your body and in your emotions. Love you.
God bless, and we'll see you next time.